All right, so let's make a formal introduction for our listeners. Uh, good morning, Colin. My name is Claudio, and I'm calling you from Washington, D.C., uh, from the studio in Fairfax City. We're very humble, grateful that Colin Bass accepted our invitation to our show. Colin, welcome to the show, man. Oh, thank you very much, Claudio. It's a pleasure to be here. Same here. And it's, well, a good should... after... it's good afternoon from me because good afternoon uh, for you. I'm Absolutely. in the mountains in Wales. And, uh, good for it's... you, man. How's the weather down there nowadays? Yeah, it's a bit overcast. Yeah. So not 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 as summery as it should be, but we're waiting for the sun. We're always waiting for the sun in Wales. <laughs> I know what you mean. I know. I know what you mean. Uh, so usually I start with the, the same question for every guest. Uh, you know, with the pandemic, we the last two years we have living crazy time here. In the United States over a million folks die. Unfortunately. Uh, we had a crazy president that didn't believe in vaccine or stuff like that. So, how how the COVID, the pandemic affected you, your your family, your your sanity, your inability to tour, and how you hold it up? Man? Well, as I was just telling you, uh, you know, one of my uh, here in Wales, I've kind of in the last ten years, I kind of discovered certain other aspects of living that uh, that I am interested in. And that's it's it's been quite good during the last few years because, I mean, we run a small farm here, and we have some animals, and uh, we we you know grow stuff. And also, the, six years ago, we we bought a little shop in the town down the uh, a couple of miles from here, and uh, we we turned it into this health food shop. So you can get organic veg and, uh, you know, vitamins and stuff. But we stock a wide range of things. But mainly we concentrate on food because yeah. that's the way to health is to eat well, you know. So, you know, and we, we, we started that and it's become quite a success. So this is a lot of work. But now we employ people and uh, it, it's grown in that way. And uh, during the pandemic, Funnily enough, I mean, you know, here they had a lockdown yeah. and um, it was like only essential workers allowed to. And we were essential workers because we're supplying food to people, you know. So actually, uh, then I started uh, working in the shop quite a lot uh, and delivering to people who didn't want to, you know, vulnerable people who didn't want to, and around here, this is, is, everything is all spread out. It's very rural. So ever, yeah, that was quite pleasant to walk, drive through the <laughs> countryside and, and then just, uh, have a distant chat with people who were feeling probably a bit isolated. And so different aspects of, of enjoyment of life came to the fore in the lockdown, funnily enough. And also our business was really going up because the people who actually came to the shop, they were coming in perhaps for the first time because they were sort of shopping locally. Uh, because mostly here people, they drive about 15 miles to the big supermarket or something like that. And that became that became a bit difficult and people were queuing and uh, so people didn't want to do that. So they started going, oh, we've got some shops locally. And, and I think that uh, uh, we've managed to maintain a lot of those customers because I think people discovered coming to a small shop and getting a personal service and getting uh, having a chat, you know, and all uh, is it's a thing that is disappearing. But, you know, we're trying to keep that alive. You know, we, we to tell all our staff, you know, to, to to always say hello and always, you know, can I help? And, you know, when you go to the impersonal, more impersonal life that we seem to be drifting towards in the big cities, you know, is sort of, I think, uh, detrimental to the spirit. And, uh, you know, so I was really happy to sort of discover this and, and discover that the, it's a really interesting world of getting to know people and and also trying to uh, encourage them and give them advice about healthy eating because you suddenly realize with shock that not a, man, not a lot of people know about this, you know. And uh, so, you know, my wife has started up a, a sort of an online business sort of saying cooking without recipes, just cook healthy stuff, use up your old food. I, you know, I can show you how to do this. It's called the intuitive cook. And that's going quite well. And, um, 
yeah so other things have come along but meanwhile i mean i'm in my little studio i've got my little log cabin in the next near the house yeah. and this is my little escape hatch yeah. and uh, i come in here and uh, you know and I, I i'm working on lots of music so actually what with the increased business and doing the farm as well this is something you have to do get up early but uh, i find i'm working more than ever and right. i've i've reached retirement age some time ago <laughs> but, yeah. but I finally i'm managing to do some honest work <laughs> But would your kids take over that, or I don't know if you have children? No, I have a daughter, but she's she's at the moment she's there living out in Indonesia, so yeah. Uh, so uh, she comes over. I see her maybe once twice a year, and I've got a grandson, and uh, yeah. So, but no, it's just me and my wife here. So we and, uh, to take the somebody who take the business over to the next the next generation if well you know. maybe we'll see that but i'm not i'm not about i'm not planning on giving up <laughs> giving up anything at the moment <laughs> no, no. are you are you are you playing uh so were you is music playing in the background um where no no no, no in your shop Shop. In my shop, yes, I do. I have a, I, I program it all myself. You know, well, it's on, it's on shuffle, but uh, it's like everything is. Uh, I enjoy choosing the music for that because right. it's, uh, if it's a mixture of, ideas, of stuff. It's a mixture of, of stuff. Idea, you can use the radios, all the radios. Yeah, 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 yeah. Play in the background. <laughs> where, where, were you born? Like in a musical family? I mean, how old were you when you perhaps? Took, I don't know, piano lessons or guitar lessons. Or like no, that. no, because I sort of grew up in a sort of a, I don't know, working class family in South London. Yeah. And my, 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 my mother was the youngest of 12 children. And uh, so the only th the musical background there was that my we, occasionally we would uh, and at some point we were I was living when I was about eight years old my father died and we, so we had to, we moved back to to live with my mother's parents and so my grand and granddad and by which time they were quite old but and that was back in Wandsworth in South London. And every now and then there would be big parties. And because my, <laughs> because I had so many aunts and uncles and cousins, so a lot of people would come to these parties and there was a piano in the front room and my granddad would play, you know, uh, sing song things. And my mother then would play piano, sing song things. And everybody in the family would sort of do a turn and sing a song or everybody would sing together. And, um, those are the kind of musical th things that I remember, which was like just communal expressions of celebration and fun, you know. I, I, so I didn't have any formal education, but I was obsessed with music. I was obsessed with music. I didn't even realize that I was obsessed with music, but I was, you know, when I was looking back. So, you know, it was like, first of all, it was kind of, I don't know, when I was growing, I'm quite old, Claudio. So, I mean, I, when I was growing up in the in the 50s, you know, when I first heard uh, Elvis Presley, Buddy Holly, <coughs> um, all those, and we had a little record player at home. And, uh, you know, those are the, my memories, it, listening over and over and over again to Peggy Sue and uh, and just listening to that. And so that got, I became obsessed with music. And then of course, early sixties, Beatles, the Stones, the Yardbirds, Eric <laughs> Clapton. <Of course. laughs> and you know, that, that, that decade was fantastic decade for music, of course, we're still listening to all that stuff. And um, yeah, so, and that encompassed a gr an incredible revolution, didn't it? You know, that from the early Beatles and the, the, the beat group and the pop groups that gradually, and then they evolved into the creative explosion of the, the Beatles and the Stones in the, in the middle sixties. And then the, the psychedelic years and the, you know, that was a quite, a, quite an amazing decade for, for music and everything moved very fast. 
when you see the development of like the early Beatles to to the breakup, you know, it's kind of like, wow, that's that's quite a career arc in six years, you know. Absolutely, man. And when so, you were like in, in equivalent of here, the high school, you know, finishing, what kind of, were you able to, to buy record? You were listening to the radio, how you acquire, how you develop a taste in music, how you... Yeah, well, it was difficult because there wasn't much radio, music radio in those days, you know. It, but then in the mid 60s, you had the pirate radios and yeah. things like that. And so I used to listen to a lot of the pirate radios. And then on Radio London, one of the ships uh, that were broadcasting outside waters, outside the territorial waters, because that's the way that they could, they couldn't get a license to operate, you know. So, uh, in the UK and be a commercial station, you weren't allowed to do that. So we had all these pirate radio ships. And um, one eye opener was uh, in 67, you know, John Peel started broadcasting in the middle of the night, the perfumed garden his, was his program. And that's where I heard for the first time, like John Fahey, Leonard Cohen, uh, all the psychedelic stuff, and uh you know man it was pretty cosmic you know and uh <laughs> yeah good good for you man so that to develop and then so you reach you were 18 at the time or so and you have well music was very important to you uh, but you got any pressure from family say no go to college man forget about music you're not going no. to make any money same musician you're going to be a hippie Forget that nonsense, go to university, go to London, study, forget about the stuff. No, I didn't I didn't really have any uh pressure. any 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 pressure because my mum was widowed and uh she was busy and basically I've always been a bit of a dropout, Claudio, a bit of an out outlier because I, 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 you know, I think I was quite bright when I was a kid. I mean, you know, in England, we had this thing, 11, 11 plus, you had to pass an examination when you were 11 years old to decide whether you went to a grammar school, a posh school, or you went to a, an ordinary school, secondary modern school. And I passed this thing and I got a scholarship to some would be posh school. Yeah. And uh, really, I hated it, you know, uh, all this, you know, that, and that's where you begin to see that, like, the, the class system that's endemic in, in, uh, in British society. And uh, so I didn't feel accepted in there either. And um, basically, I just sort of stopped going. And I left when I was 15. So no qualifications, nothing. But uh, luckily, and I was wanting to get away from home. So I left home quite early because then my mom remarried. I, was a, I had a stepfather. I didn't get on with him. Uh, I left home when I was about 17. And, How do you manage? Uh, well, my brother got me a job in a place where he was working, my older brother. And lucky. Thank you, Dave. And um, so I and I worked. I was it was like the the the. the the professional photographer boom so i was working developing photos and things like that it was a really interesting thing to learn and we had uh, you know high profile clients in uh, we in my brother's firm so uh, you know that was kind of interesting and i was learning a trade actually for a couple of years but you know i was also saving my money and then buying a guitar and, you know, then answering an advertisement in one of the music papers, the Melody Maker, to join a group. And I joined a group uh, as a guitarist and uh, called The Crisis with a K. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, I within about, you know, after a while when I was before I was 18, it was just like we went professional. I left my job. We all went and lived in a house. So we had a manager, you know, and we would travel up and down the UK everywhere, sleeping in the van and eating chips. And, uh, you know, we would we wouldn't I don't remember us actually ever really having any money, but somehow we managed to 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 live and we got a job and you would drive up 
to the north of England for 15 pounds, you know, and uh, uh, so, but the great thing in those days was that uh, all the, this was before DJs took over local dances and things like this. Yeah. So there were lots of local venues, like little town halls or uh, in, the, you know, in little towns all over England where, you know, they wanted a band for, for, the, for the night, you know. So most weekends we would work at Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and uh, we would, and, so, and a lot of times you would get gigs as a support band. And then we started to be a support band for, for you know, we played with Pink Floyd, The Nice, The Move, uh, the Arthur Brown, uh, whatever. So uh, Bonzo Dog Duda band, fantastic. And um, yeah, so in those days, there was kind of an interesting circuit of gigs that has completely disappeared now. Uh, whereby you could, so to speak, serve an apprenticeship, sure. you know, by, by, by opening for big bands and uh, seeing how they do it and, uh, you know, learning, learning your trade. My so was, was Led Zeppelin popular at the time or? Was what? Was Led Zeppelin very popular at the time or not? Well, I remember when Led Zeppelin uh, started, you know, and uh, saw them at the Fishmonger's Arms in Wood Green, a pub, in a, a hall at the back of a pub. And they were billed as the new Yardbirds. Yeah. That was just before they got their Led Zeppelin name. And um, yeah, it was, it was phenomenal. So, you know, the first the first album, I loved it, you know, and it was, yeah, it was, uh, it was really uh, man, you, so you were, you, you opened some show for them. Unbelievable, man. Unbelievable. <laughs> Unbelievable. You know. I have seen yeah, so we, many, we, I have we seen never so got many to bands the... in my life and uh, <laughs> never, never let Zeppelin together, never Pink Floyd together. Never Genesis together with with Peter Gabriel. I, of course, I have seen individual member of all the fans and uh, yeah. Genesis like ten times. But man, that's what a, you know. That's in my opinion. That in the history of music, according to me, <laughs> those are the top three bands: Led Zeppelin, Genesis, and, and, and Pink Floyd. Uh, by, okay. by far, you know. You know. Uh, I think we we supported Pink Floyd at the Imperial College in London. Yeah. And it was it was one of the first gigs that Dave Gilmore did. My God, man. Right. Yeah. So you start making a little bit of money. So didn't your brother phone you up? Or well, at the time we didn't have maybe we had text over. Hey, come back here to the photography shop, forget about no. He said nah. you're, you're you're good to go. And I was always left to my own devices, as we say. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, and I've been trying to survive ever since. Yeah. yeah, well, you have done well, man. And, and then, so you were making a little bit of money. And then, uh, uh, so from in that particular band, you know, what, how long would, would you guys stay there in, with the crisis before yeah, you went well, to the club? In the end, it wasn't sustainable, you know, because we never made it to be the top band. So, uh, and we, you know, we didn't really record. So, you know, that was it. And, uh people had to earn some money so you know there was a brief period where i went to work in another photo laboratory for about uh, six months but all the time looking for another band you know because in those days you could buy the melody maker newspaper where all the news about the things went on and in the back they had adver advertisements yeah. for musicians wanted and I, I I auditioned for Super Tramp. My God, man! Yeah, great. Right well, yeah. the two of them, the two of them, the, the you know the two keyboard players. Oh, what are their names now? Roger and uh, the Roger. other guy. And um, was in a little bedsit place in Earl's Court in London. So this was when they first were hanging around in London trying to get a record deal and things like that. And I think they had one record out on the a and label, I think. But they were looking to put a whole band together. So I went along to this little bed sit and sat and, sat and played along. But 
you know, obviously I didn't get, get, didn't get the job. This Scottish guy called Dougie got the job. He's uh, who I later met. Yeah. But, um, and also I auditioned with Atomic Rooster and, uh, you know, just, just crazy things. Spooky tooth, you know, and, and of course I was a bit too young at the time, really, you know, to, to really be a heavy player like that. You know? So, uh, so yeah, so I didn't get that, but it was interesting to do that. And uh, then I just got a job with, um, with a sort of a soul band who had had uh, a lot of hits in the, in the, in the sixties, the foundations, yeah. you know, baby now that I found you and all that. And so they were going out and doing the cabaret circuit around England. And um, so I joined them and that was a real eye opener because that was it was a great what we call dues paying because, you know, we had a lot of work going doing cabaret clubs and you'd be in one town like Manchester for five days and then on to Liverpool, for five day, you know, and you do all that. And these guys were just so great, you know, and uh, the, the, the guy who organized it, the trombonist and percussionist, uh, Eric Allendale now now dead but um he was kind of like a mentor to me the jamaican yeah. jamaican guy who was incredibly well read he was an artist too you know and he kept giving me books to read and you know and then we spent a lot of time sort of jamming and things like that you know and uh so really kind of honed my jamming chops there you know and uh and with and working with different people like uh, the flute player from trinidad uh the, just a kind of more international feel and uh that was an eye-opener for me as a working class south london boy you know it was sort of like getting into uh, and becoming part of you know other ways of looking at things musically culturally you know and uh, so that was what I call, you know, my university, my education. <laughs> so, <laughs> but good for you, man. Man, if you have gotten the gig with the job with Supertramp, your, your life would have been very, very different. <laughs> yeah. In a way, I don't know. If, maybe you were not ready or I don't know if God exists. Maybe it wasn't the path for you, you know. So I don't know. Looking back is... Maybe that was the best decision, you know. I don't it know. is. It is what it is. You know, it wasn't up to me. So, uh, yeah. you know, I was just trying for a job. But I think it was a bit premature on my part, you know. But I was ambitious, you know. So. <laughs> be ambitious. And then, uh, and then you join uh, Clancy, right? After that, or? yeah, I joined Clancy, which was a, another international group, and that was that was a kind of well, it became. We had a different some different lineups at the beginning, but we were kind of part of that pub rock scene, okay. although we were never really not like Doctor Feelgood and people like that who came up through that Brinsley Schwartz, but. Um, you know, it was just a really good time because yeah. you, there were loads of pubs suddenly to play in and they were packed. And we got, you know, there were A&R guys coming around to sign acts up and we signed with Island Records. Uh, and then we did some recording and we didn't quite get on with Muff Wingwood. Was, I don't know why, but because he was a really nice guy, but something in the band uh, you know whatever and um so they dropped us you know after we'd had some an advance you know and uh then next week the a and r guy from warner brothers was in the pub and he signed us so we ended up doing two albums with warner brothers and then you know that was the first time i'd sort of actually started we started doing a bit of touring in holland and germany and uh stuff like that so that was kind of opening up a, a so you weren't making much some money at the time a world no not really you no you, you know you get a record deal but basically you've got to pay all that back you know and uh they were actually unusually for warner brothers we were actually getting a kind of a stipend every every month you know, they, they were trying that out to sort of because so that we'd be kind of like the house band and uh you know, and uh, yeah, so we were getting paid, 
yeah so we're getting paid well i wouldn't say it wouldn't say we were making lots of money that's i would say the record company was losing lots of money yeah. <laughs> i would it was very hard to get gigs at the time i mean the, i don't know the comes of a tour manager who book you three gigs in in the uk then you go to i don't know uh holland or germany whatever it was you you did on your own or the record label was doing that for you no we had a, there was an agent who was an agent yeah it was i can't forget who that was but there was an agent who was getting us gigs you know so so you were playing it up to three four nights a week or, or yeah quite 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 a lot especially around the london pub scene yeah but you know we would go travel around yeah, yeah. it was kind of there there was an interest in 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 the sort of grassroots pub yeah. music you know it's a, and i really enjoyed all that you know and that, that's when i was getting into i don't know you started getting into well that was that was also a kind of an education i think actually every group is a uh, is an education every lineup you find yourself in you always learn something and but with with Clancy because we ended up with uh Gaspar Lawal Nigerian percussionist and he was a big influence on on my life really because through him I learned a lot about Nigerian music and the Fela Kuti and uh, the the big drum orchestras and things like that I used to go around to his house and just sort of like he would play you stuff and then you would jam on the he would hand out the percussion and we'd just jam and you know that was an education and that sort of got me into other scenes around london playing with musicians from ghana and uh, things like that you just drifted into these worlds because there's worlds within worlds in london you know and um so uh, that's towards the end of clancy i was doing that and playing on gasper's solo albums that he did he did two great solo albums and I, I played on those and then I got into another Ghanaian band and and then I met my friends from the Three Mustafas Three. That was the, the next band that I was in sort of busy. Yeah, free free to elaborate because you can actually somehow that, your, your wife drifted into an international kind of I don't know, flavor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But actually, in between that, there was yeah. uh, after Clancy. No, immediately after Clancy was Steve Hillage. Yeah, Steve. Yeah, feel free to elaborate how you got the gig with with. with the yeah, band and... sure. Well, I mean, you know, I was. It was just. I think it was just one of those serendipitous things, you know. It, it, it was. I got a. I got a call from somebody. Uh, I think it was actually Steve's manager. And he said, oh, I've, I heard you, Clancy have split up. That's a shame. I really like Clancy, you know, and all that. He says, well, uh, St Steve Hillage is looking for a bass player. He's, well, in fact, he was putting a band together because, you know, he'd done this album with Todd Rundgren in, yep. uh, called L. Yep. And basically they he come back to london and they were him and miquette were they were sort of like obviously wait wondering what was happening next and all of a sudden this album suddenly entered the album charts and so there was kind of like whoa where's the band you know and uh so steve had to find a band in a hurry and uh so i got the call and uh said go around and see steve in kensington somewhere and went around his, his his place where they were living and uh he was a really nice guy he's steve is a very nice man and uh you know he said hi man come in you know and we just sat down and jammed yeah he just played and i just played and he said yeah okay that's good we got clive bunker on drums uh you know and i'm just sorting out this keyboard player and the keyboard player phil hodge was was a guy who uh he somebody in the record company knew as you know had a brother who was a keyboard player so they were going keyboard player keyboard player. so they found this phil hodge yeah. and uh steve went okay and he got him a moog and and basically showed him how to do that and he did a great job you know so and there was basil brooks 
on the very early sequences and everything. So there was a lot of this very early sequencing going on. Basil and Miquette were, were both on these little, what are, what are they called? These, I forget what they're called now, the little flat briefcase kind of sequences that uh, used to have that set up all these arpeggios and, uh, and, and loops and things. And uh, yeah, so that was that was really a, a bit of an eye opener for me because that was you know that was you got paid. I had to turn up for three weeks of rehearsal every day, and um, because we were going out on tour, sure. and uh, so it was like we were, and it's very complex material. Uh, there's a lot of time changes. There's a lot of pauses and stop and count for 19 and then come in and then you know it's it's pretty tricky stuff but you know I was kind of quite malleable my mind was more malleable in those days and so uh, I, I just uh, took to it and uh, really enjoyed it and I was, had nothing else in my life to concentrate on so I was just doing it and um and it was it was great it was a real education and, and and steve although everybody looks at him and thinks he was some sort of pothead hippie steve i think was <laughs> definitely at the time and probably still is one of the most uh, focused people that i know he knew exactly what he wanted you know and wow. and uh would sort of you know but uh, would allow you some some freedom but you know he, he but he could very calmly and gently explain what he wants to do and uh yeah a very focused character and a very very good guy to work for good yeah. for you and you were just touring um uh, we toured in, the in uk europe? we toured in europe we did that thing in germany which you can still see on youtube the the rock yeah. palace thing or oh, rock palace yeah yeah that's which a, was really that's strange a very famous show yeah but i don't think the audience really knew who we were at all it was just they were just there for the filming of some band and uh, yeah. so it wasn't like a because it was shot in the afternoon or something i you know at a school hall so uh i don't know what that was all about but uh you know that's the gig we were performing at that time we played around europe and we went to the to the states we played in america it was the first time i've been to the us Time, and we yeah. were supporting the electric light orchestra like coast to coast in stadiums you know so we wow. played you know the first gig i played in the us was uh the forum in los angeles then the cow palace in san francisco <laughs> and then we were in the cobo hall in detroit and then we went down south and then we were in the, the last gig i think was madison square gardens and there's quite, there's quite a good bootleg available from that a CD. I actually bought it uh, it's from the Madison Square Garden uh, concert. It's, 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 it's you ever played good. here in Washington, D.C., around this area? No, I no, don't no. remember. No we played in a lot of places that I don't remember where we were. What the, what the year are we talking about now when you did the game? 76, 77. I got you. Okay, that was obviously... Yeah, so you were doing... You were doing okay. I mean, you know, in all the all the venues that you mentioned, those are big venues. I mean, yeah, I've it was been a real eye opener. Most of them, you know, and uh, yeah, and uh, wow, those are big names, man. Good for you, man. And then, so you, after the tour ended, of course, you joined Camo in '79. So, uh, so what do you? So that that ended in '70, what '76, '77. 77 yeah and then i was then i was playing uh I, i was playing with a few different just gigs you know around town and uh looking for a job but then i played with my friend jim cuomo who had also been involved a bit with clancy he produced one a single for us and played on a couple of tracks saxophonist extraordinary character who died a few about four years ago um and yes extraordinary character originally from from chicago and uh played soprano sax yeah. uh played domra the little string yeah. instruments he used to play and write really sort of wacky strange songs he was in a band called spoils of war and that their stuff now is quite sort of a cult in the uh the old you know 
<laughs> the old vinyl scene and uh you know that they and a band called Mormos and he he moved to France for a, he was in France for a, for a while playing with some French musicians and um yeah I, he had a band he was in London at the time that's right between the Hitlidge band and Camel and he had to he was he had, him and his friend who was a uh writer they they made this musical which was going to be performed at the edinburgh festival for a few days up in in those days which is a drama arts festival every year it's quite big and uh so that was i did that and there was a percussionist and a, and a piano player called ollie marland who later went on to become uh tina turner's keyboard player Wow. now lives now lives in LA I haven't spoken to him for years but uh but if he ever hears this Ollie um I'm sorry so and uh <laughs> so that that was and so we enjoyed playing together so we had a little band called the casual band and we played around and uh you know just small gigs and things like that but it was a really that was also an educational experience because jim was such a genius and uh you know he could play blindfold chess with about five people and very rarely lose you know and he was he was kind of one of the first guys who started writing music in computer code you know, when computers first started coming out and you first had the arcade games. And he now is known mostly for being the composer of the music, which he programmed in with numbers, uh, for a, a famous old arcade game called um, uh, Defender of the Realm. And so game freaks, they know that this is one of the first games and uh his soundtrack is is known to some complete freaks <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and uh yeah so he was a very interesting guy and then he moved to paris and uh yeah then but then i went off to join join camel and i yeah. used to so, meet up so free to elaborate how how do you end up joining camel you went to an audition or or with the your back yeah, well, crazy, again yeah. went to, went for an audition you know of course but um it, it was they were looking for they were rehearsing in this place uh in a barn in the countryside up in norfolk uh this was 79 and uh they had they had kit watkins jan shell house and it was andy and andy andy ward right. andy latimer and uh they've been trying out bass players and um so it was their tour manager was it was a uh, my good friend uh the laurie small and he'd been he'd also done some work for the steve hillage band as a tour manager so basically when they were it's just like steve they were really looking for a bass player and somebody said oh yeah well there's uh you know it's colin bass bloke uh they wouldn't know me from adam but uh you know so and and then you know so laurie got in touch with me and said you know camel are looking for a bass player and um you better get up to norfolk you know and so they told me when to be there and i bought a train ticket and, and went up there with my bass and um it, yeah so and uh they were all there and they were playing an early version of him to her i seem to remember so i just kind of walked in and they said oh hey we'll plug in there you know so i plugged in and i sort of made damn sure that i could follow this song and you know and i just sort of, i was listening on my way in you know and then i was sort of like going uh, okay and so i'm somehow managed to uh, disciplined myself that uh, to to actually play a pretty good version of it without having heard it before and uh you know bluffing really but uh they they seem to like that and, and andy andy always told me afterwards he really liked my tone because he was you know they'd had before uh richard sinclair 
And I think it, sometimes Andy sort of got a bit tired of Richard's really high register stuff and uh, things like that. And so, and me, I was definitely coming from a, a from a, 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 a sort of a, a bass playing school that said, you occupy the bottom end and you supply the, the rhythm, the pulse, you supply, you know, I'm not trying to be Jacko. I'm not trying to be, uh, you know, I'm trying to make the group knit together. Exactly. I, yeah. And uh, and I can see, and the group is knitting together, but I can see my role for a bass guitar to fit in there, to fit in with everybody rather. And I think that's actually, that's a useful, useful uh thing to remember is use, useful lesson i think is that if you go in sort of trying to show what you can do then somehow you're putting up a barrier you're not actually going to connect as well as if you go in and listen and say what can i do for the song yeah absolutely. you know uh, i'm not trying to show how good i am i'm just trying to make this song sound even better than it does already and uh, provide what it needs to look at the whole thing rather than just, oh, yeah, I can play this, you know, and oh, I've got room. Yeah, I, 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 I suppose, right, it's, it's like when you get a job, me professional with a company, right? They hire you to do that when well, you need to get the job. So you need to, you know, I'm doing what you tell me, but down the road, you can say, well, not only I can do your stuff, but I can provide this or that, provide new input for the next track or whatever, and they will be happy. But, but, yeah. but if you start like that, you will say, man, this guy's kind of complicated. We told them <laughs> to play this kind of line and he's not doing it. So maybe That's right. he's a good player, but he's not, yeah. he's not going to be part of a team, right? You yeah. Know, and also they were looking for, for because they were going to go and record yeah right pretty soon afterwards and yeah. so that, i think they were probably getting a bit desperate so, That's right. so yeah, i yeah. just thought i want to show that i could be a trustworthy uh member of this team you know and uh so luckily and i assessed the situation correctly and uh yeah. and i got offered the job so i was Good. that was but to me this is just luck i'd never really listened to camel before then camel was was well known at the time they have done yeah. Before you got like, uh, the one Mirage, like four or five album before you joined the 79. So they were kind of yeah. well known. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in, in Europe. So, and, yeah. By the way, you mentioned Jacob Pistorius. Have you ever met the guy? No. No. He was Seen him play a few times. Yeah. He's so, whether well, it's a guy, yeah. Times. Yeah. Uh, well, genius. Um, uh, you know, just a incendiary genius. Really? It was a good, yeah, Pat Metheny, Pat Metheny always talk about Jaco at the beginning when Pat Metheny began, yeah. and he began putting his band together. And uh, of course, I never met Jaco, I never seen Jaco, but I know he's like a legend, you know. I And I wonder why he was that good. I mean, he played differently, that you are a best player. He he did a lot hey. of stuff that was unknown, like... Like Jimi yeah. Hendrix on, on guitar? Yeah, he, was to he had a totally unique style. He had a totally unique sound. Yeah. And, you know, it's one of those things, and he played a battered old basses, you know, and these are big, big acoustic amps that they used to, to make. I had one. I got one after seeing Jacko when I was in Clancy. And, uh, you know, fantastic amp. And um, But, you know, basically it was all ragged stuff, but he could just make it sound sweet, you know, because it's in the fingers. Yeah. It's in the fingers and the mind, you know. It could probably make anything sound sweet, you know, any old cheap instrument, you know. So uh, some people are like that. But uh, I know he, he was just his approach, you know, was just totally out of the blue, you know. So and his tone, you know, he had this he invented that sound of the sort of slightly nasally, gritty, uh, fretless sound, you know. Yeah. That, that yeah. dexterity of finger work, you know, is, ah. but, you know, it's no good just being dexterous with your fingers. It's what you play when you're being dexterous. That's what that's what's important. You know, you see a lot of people who can play a lot of notes, but, you know, uh, it's kind of not always as good because you go, yeah, well, OK, I don't need that many notes. I just need to you to feel some expression. Yeah of a physical or mathematical approach 
I, I, I don't go for music like that. Some people do, but um, yeah. But, you know, that's why Andy and Camel is so great because, you know, he's, he's, uh, that's what I, that's what I liked about the band in the, as soon as I heard it, you know, was that the, he was not into cleb being clever for the sake of it, although he could be. He was into creating a, a vibe, creating, uh, projecting an emotion. And, you know, which you do with very few notes. You can do with very few notes, you know. And then and Richard, Richard Sinclair ended up joining Caravan, right? After you joined Camel, right? So, yeah. He's, uh, he's no, no, player. Richard Sinclair was in Caravan before he joined Camel. Oh, I see, I see. He was one of the original members of Caravan. Yeah, I got you, got you, got you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, good, man. man. What about the, all the story that you got, man? And <laughs> if, you, if you look... If you look back in your years with Camel, any can you say what's your favorite album of the one that you were involved with? Or? Yeah, I've, basically for me, I'm very proud of a couple of tracks on I Can See Your House From Here. And I really think Nude is a really good underrated album. Uh, but for me, like Harbor of Tears is the is the is the is the one that I think is a is is a kind of a, a masterpiece, you know. It's uh, of Andy's, you know. It's just it's just a fantastic piece of writing from start to finish. Yeah. And you know, whereas some of the other tracks, some of the other albums have got, you know, they, they may be more. Some tracks are standouts, and some are kind of uh, all right. But you know, Harbor of Tears, the whole thing from start to finish. Is just uh, a wonderful sustained piece of music, and uh, I always enjoy it when we play excerpts from it. And when we did the tour uh, to to do that, the what was it, the coming of age tour, with Dave Stewart on the drums and Mickey Simmons, and uh, was that was that that tour? I can't remember. No, Mickey Simmons was later. Uh, Do you know, I don't remember. But anyway, I may, it may have been Mickey Simmons. I think it probably was. Uh, but, you know, we were all playing. Uh, no, it was Foss. It was Foss. Foss Patterson. That's right. Yeah. Mickey Simmons did the Dust and Dreams tour. And this, that was, which came before that. So another good album. I just like Harbour of Tears because I, I, Andy asked me to help him mix it. So we had a very fun time mixing that album that was under, you know, in trying situations because, you know, a six, uh, you know, what was it, 16? Was it 16? I think it was a 16 track Soundcraft desk and, you know, uh, the two inch tape, big reels of tape you've got to keep your eye on and putting in loads of overdubs on tape where you, so you've got several instruments on one track. And you've got to sort of like make sure you're there to adjust the sound. No automation, uh, nothing. So it's all hands on faders and getting ready for when the guitar replaces the the, 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 the vocal on that track so that you can adjust quickly. And that was uh, an interesting time learning how to uh, mix something with, you know, it was pretty good material, but a pretty good the studio but uh it wasn't it wasn't as easy as it is today you know with you know multiple tracks on pro tools and uh and all this uh, but i think that it's better for it you know because of that you had to sort of really make decisions as you're mixing you know whereas you know these days you mix and then you can try various different things and but you know you're working with a two inch tape you can't just keep you know editing that and uh, it doesn't work <laughs> so so you've got to, it becomes i for me it's more of an organic process you know and you you guys with uh with come on you were playing everywhere i mean you you know there was we did a lot of gigging you know it was like yeah. when i first joined it was sort of like we recorded I can see your house from here. Then it was out on tour. Yeah. And the next year, so you would come back from tour at the beginning of the next year. And then in the middle of the next year, you were recording the next one. We were recording Nude in the summer of 80. Yeah. And 
then when that finished, you were kind of more or less just going out on tour again. And uh, yeah. Were you mayor at the time or no? No. Oh, yeah. Because it's very hard to, you know, have a, a wife and kids if you go. The oh, life yeah. of a musician is it's not as glamorous as some people would like to believe it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. won the road for three, four months or whatever it is, or six months and different continent, different countries. Yeah. It's crazy, you know? Yeah. Well, you know. You know. Um, uh, that's. Yeah, no, it's difficult. It's difficult to hold down a, a, a relationship, but uh, I guess that depends on relationship and how how you well you fit together. But anyway, that's uh, that's another story. Yeah. And then Andrew got sick, right? And you guys stopped as a band for. Uh, no, a, no, Andy Ward got ill. Oh, I got you. Got you. So yeah. towards the end of the nude tour. Yeah. Uh, Andy was definitely kind of uh, having trouble, Andy Ward. Yeah. And basically that was very distressing for everybody. I, you know, Andy, we, we shared a flat together in London and it was sort of like we didn't, I didn't notice, I think, really that he had some problems. Uh, I was the last one to notice, but Andy knew and Andrew knew what was going on, really. Or it was kind of like, it was going, oh gosh. And I was always kind of making excuses, I think, for Andy. But in the end, by the end of the tour, you could see Andy just uh, somehow, he needed to stop. You know, he needed to stop. Uh, and I think it was just kind of like a, a mental exhaustion. And so at the end of that tour, somewhere in the last gig was somewhere down in south of France, I think. And so we came. And at the time, I was sort of had a, a, a French girlfriend who was in Paris. And uh, so I got off the bus in Paris. And that was it. That was the last time I saw Andy for years, you know, because he went back and sort of regrouped and had to sign the, had to deliver an album for Decca. And he did the single factor uh, with uh, David Payton and, uh, you know, uh, all the Abbey Road musicians. And I think that was, that was, that was, you know, that was good for him. That was, that, that was he was trying to just to get away from it, it. It ended with some sort of like really bad sort of bad vibes, you know, uh, at the end of the new tour. So anyway, I was kind of like a bit, that's why I probably didn't, take all this seriously and that's why i was one of the last to notice that andy ward was not very well um and i'm I, i'm sorry to him for that because you know i i think i don't know what was wrong with me maybe i had my own issues in fact i've always had issues claudio and if you've got well, every, everybody does six everybody. hours i can sit here and tell you about them but yeah, every, everybody does you know, that's, you know being, being a human being you, whether you whether you are a musician or a medical doctor, it's completely relevant. You know, the psychological issues, you know, getting along with a band, getting along with five people. You know, sometimes I have five with my wife too. But we live in the same <laughs> house, right? Never mind going on tour with five guys for four months in different countries. You know? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, people so I got off the bus in Paris and uh, my friend Jim Cuomo was living there. He just yeah. had a deal to do a solo album for CBS in France. And uh, he said, hey, come on. And uh, so I ended up at least getting some work in Paris. Yeah. I got off with my two bases and a uh, suitcase. And that was it. And um, yeah, so that was, I spent about six months in Paris. Uh, and I played, did some recording with Gabriel Yacoub. It was brilliant, brilliant uh, sort of folk rock guy. Used to be was in a band called Malicorn uh, in France. He's really good. He's still 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 playing and writing beautiful songs, and uh, but that never got released. So 
I don't know, had some things that I'd recorded and then I got an un uncredited release on some other album uh, but I even put, forgot to put my name on and things like that. So <laughs> just these things. And I, okay. But in the end, I think I sort of ran out of money and had to go back to England and sort of uh, start doing, trying to find some work. And... Uh, so because I'd used up all my contacts in Paris. So, uh, yeah, so I came back and eventually I sort of. I think that was afterwards. Oh, yeah. No, I was sort of playing around in uh, some pubs and clubs in London. Yeah. With various lineups. And. And then uh, after Andy had done Stationary Traveller. Uh, he he rang me up and said, "Long time no see. I'll come round to see you." You know, and so he came round and uh, sort of, yeah. You know, he he said, "Would you?" I don't know. Maybe David Payton didn't want to do it, but uh, he's asked me to do the 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 tour, what the, the pressure points tour, uh, the stationary traveller promoting tour. So I did that with Chris Rainbow and uh, Ton Sherp and Zeal. Too many people on stage. And um, yeah, so that, that, that was that. And that was, but then about the same time I got involved with the, I was playing with some, with an African band in London, uh, Orchestra Jazeera and two of the guys um which was uh, ben mandelson and nigel watson they were also playing in a band that i was in with ollie marland for said keyboard player and um and his wife from austin texas jj and we were doing sort of uh what would you call it you know it was like southern southern classic rock you know and western swing and uh uh r and b stuff like uh you know etta james numbers and things like this so so like some heavy funky uh, sort of bluesy direction and uh great players uh at one point including uh keith airy who on guitar who don airy keyboard player's brother and uh keith has played since played with loads of people including tom jones and I don't know. He's played with lots of people. And uh, yeah, so there was always some gigs to be played and things like that. And uh, but then I played with this orchestra of Jazeera. And yeah, that's right. Nigel and Ben were playing in this other band that I was in. And at the same time, they were getting together this band called Three Mustafas Three, which uh, today would be considered probably was even then by some people I think it was as considered totally politically incorrect but um, you know basically there was like five sometimes six very gifted musicians who were all specialized in certain areas of music from around the world like a couple were very specialized in music of the Balkans and traveled there and uh learnt songs and could even speak some of the language and uh so and then ben was uh also involved with uh with a lot of east african music and uh so and basically ben Mandelson was the mentor of the band in in a sense musical mentor because he would just send around lots of cassettes introducing you to stuff from you know, like some obscure Colombian salsa to uh, to Turkish um, saz music and uh, to, uh, to lots of African stuff, like the classic African stuff of 60s and 70s. It's a great time for Congolese music and things like that. And, you know, just... And that was another education because then I learned very quickly about lots of different styles, especially Balkan music, especially uh, the, the very soulful sounds of, of you know, Albania and uh, things like that. This is a heart-rending stuff. And um, 
so I suddenly sort of discovered all this, you know, panoply of, of music. And what we were trying to do in the band is actually learning to play these things yeah. in our own style. But we had some really gifted musicians who played piano, accordions, like the strange reed flutes and uh, clarinets and uh, sax player. And uh, yeah, I mean, and great drummer, Nigel Watson and um, Ben on fiddle and guitar. But very kind of it's East African style guitar. And uh, he would and bazooki he played bazooki. And uh, so. This was a kind, and we put all those ingredients into this band, and we became sort of a bit, bit. It was a bit of a cult, actually. It was, it was good. We and we called ourselves Three Mustafas Three because we were masquerading as this family called Mustafa, five nephews and one uncle, and um, who would been smuggled out of their East European fictitious country called Shegarelli in refrigerators and you know we had a whole story about this and you know and what would be totally frowned upon today is that you know we were too kind of talking like this you know and sort of because we in a nondescript foreign accent because we were wanting to be uh, in it to our 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 good intention was to to be outsiders from everywhere so no matter where we were we were people would interview us and say you know well, where are you where are you guys from we just say we're from out of town you know and uh we were so of course you were. and we 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 named ourselves after different arabic scales so i was saba and uh my friend ben was hijaz and we all had the name mustafa and we wore suits and sandals and fezzes and uh we were very deadpan. It was very funny. Ben was very funny as an MC and introducing the, and talking to the audience. He was hilariously funny. And, but in a real kind of with deadpan, we would never laugh. Yeah. And so this kind of like the audience was sort of, <laughs> are these guys for real? <laughs> and we ended up, we did about five tours of the States. Really? Yeah, we played, uh, at first we were playing little clubs. There's actually a sort of a video on, on YouTube of us playing in somewhere in, where is it, North Carolina. And it's a bit like the Blues Brothers playing in the country and Western bar. You know, it was sort of like there are all these people sit lounging at the table, never seen anything like us. <laughs> of course. And, you know, we, we've been driving all overnight from Georgia or somewhere like that. And uh, we were all completely zoned out. Uh, but we performed in this little club for these people. And it was it was funny. They really enjoyed it. In the end, at first they were going, ah, well, you know, and, uh, and then they were sort of saying things and heckling. And uh, my, my friend Ben was very good at dealing with that kind of thing. So to yeah. make people laugh yeah. and so people laughed. And but so it was a very uh, entertaining band in that way. We could make you laugh. But the musicians were great. And the music when we were playing, I found was really high level, you know, and lots of fun because there was a lot of freedom involved and there was we could really play. And we did a lot of gigs around Europe. We went to Japan, uh, where they were, it was full. People had heard of us. Actually, you go to Japan and you've got a few albums out. You know, there's always somebody who's going to have them all. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, so, uh, but we, we did, did uh, about four or five good gigs in Japan. People yeah, came I, to see I wonder it. what the Japanese people thought about the band because, yeah, well, they, I don't know. I wonder too. never seen them before. I wonder too, yeah. <laughs> but I think they knew that it was a, it was kind of a joke, but that it yeah, was the yeah. music was fun to listen to, yeah. and uh, yeah. And in a were, way, were you was, guys financially successful or, or a well, bit we more? lived on it for a, for a while. I wouldn't yeah, know. I wouldn't right. call exactly financially successful, but <laughs> you know, we I, we came home with some money. Yeah. You know, I, I ran into problems uh, because we were going away quite a lot. 
And by that time, by, by 1990, I was living in Berlin and yeah. I got married in 88 in Berlin. Yeah. And, and uh, we had a daughter around 90. Uh, yes, yeah, she, she was born 1990. I should remember that. She'll kill me. Um, and so it was more difficult for me to go away and come for three months and come home with well, not a great deal of money <laughs> right. in terms of the fact that, you know, uh, you know, my, my, my wife was a, was a journalist and could uh, for the TV and uh, could earn good money. So I, in the end, there was that commitment and some, a couple of other guys in the band had run into similar kind of, commitment problems and so we stopped and it, maybe that was the best time to stop actually uh it's yeah it was good but it was like for five years or so it was quite a journey and a real education because that was another band it was great to be and everybody sort of like had their own special intellectual interests and so you know you'd end up reading a lot of books in the band you know and uh uh, that you wouldn't expect to and uh, learning stuff all the time, learning about music, but learning about, I don't know, different points of view is important. Uh, I'm quite yeah. sure that people we shouldn't all be in the same echo chamber. We got to learn right. about different points of view. Yeah, absolutely. I'm quite sure a lot of people all over the world send you emails or try to get a hope for the three Mustafa. Hey, are you coming on tour again? You know, we meet <laughs> oh, yeah. here in Tokyo or in Alaska or wherever. We're We've been asked quite recently if we were going to, if we could get together to do some American gigs. Yeah. Really? But I, I, no, anyway, two of the, two of the main guys who are really important, the percussionist and uh, Tim, uh, they died. So they're no longer with us, you know. So yeah, it would. And then you went back to Camel, right? In what? Well, yeah, and then, again, yeah, and then well, I mean, because in the meantime, Andy had been going through quite a bad time yeah. uh, legally, you know, because I think they 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 found out that there was some money had gone missing over the years, and uh, so they took. Uh, ex-management to, to court and uh, but I, th I think it was basically to do with I don't know this so maybe I should not speak about it but anyway I know that the outcome of the the the, the court case was that Andy managed to get back a good share of the writing credits and royalties that had somehow been sequestered somewhere else and uh, and you know I think you know it was mainly for him and Peter Bardens, but you know Andy Ward got had some credits, and so did uh, Doug Ferguson, the original bass player. So I think you know that it was that was a positive ending, but then Andy was trying to get another deal, and I think it was probably at the, the absolute low point of the 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 the, the sense of validity of prog rock because he just couldn't get a deal. You know, <clears throat> nobody was interested. And um, because, you know, every, everything was the, the mood of the music had changed, you know, so, uh, yeah, so I can't remember what else was going on. But anyway, uh, so then that's when Andy and, and uh, Susan decided to go to, to California. Uh, from from London, and to set up their own record label, yeah. And uh, luckily, they were able to to partner with Bertus, which was I don't know what the, the business is like these days, but uh, Bertus was a big Dutch firm, uh, a, not a big Dutch firm, but uh, a, a very good European distributor. And uh, it was the CD boom. You know, and uh, so it means that, you know, artists could set up their own record labels. You could get the CDs printed. You could, uh, uh, you know, uh, so I've done it myself, inspired by all that. But, uh, you know, that was so and that was a good move for them. 
and that's where he went over there and record started writing the the dust and dreams thing uh which is kind of nice because it's the story of going west and looking for your fortune it kind of it's that was kind of is resonant with their situation at the time but uh yeah and so then he just called me and said yeah, come over and do some bass parts so i went over to california and uh did some bass parts and a bit of singing because there's a lot of musicians on that album that's because uh, davy payton is on that as well i can't remember what he did but anyway i was singing some th I, I did some i did some work on that i don't can't exactly remember what but um and it's a very nice album and of course then there was it got good response especially in europe so we well then then there was a tour so then we would go over to california again and then rehearse and then go out on tour so usually in the states actually we'd, we'd rehearse in california then we'd play a few gigs like the belly up in san diego and the yeah. and uh, like a warm-up gig in can't remember where and uh, that that an amazing gig where they serve you serve people dinner first the san capastriano uh i forget what that's called anyway if that's san capastriano is right i'm not sure but um capastriano that's probably what i ate that night san capastriano so uh yeah and but then we would go to japan and then around europe yeah. so japan's been quite good mark, uh, uh, market really oh let's say market i don't know about the market but it's been there's lots of nice people there who come and listen to us <laughs> yeah. and then you but you beside at the time you know in in and out of camo and the, all the other band you were involved you you did you know three albums on your own right an outcast of the island yeah in the minta the well end and you they're, they're very good albums actually yeah. thank you i mean i think outcast of the islands is the one that still sells the most yeah. i still sell more of but it's, it's, it was the biggest production is because you know we managed to spend some money on it and i took the tapes the two inch tapes over yeah. to california mid in the middle it's recorded in poland and then i just took the tapes over to andy and stayed there for a week and he just put guitars on and uh, we had a nice time then i took the tapes back and uh carried on recording in poland so that was recorded with quite a, a good budget uh, uh over a sort of six week period so you know when you've got a budget and when you've got time and you've got the possibility to bring in you know to do things and pay people uh then obviously you know that's more satisfactory you can get more things done the the two other albums uh in the meantime and at wild end just recorded in my home studios at the time in the meantime was in berlin and uh at wild end was done here in wild end studio mm -hmm. so you know these are these these are different kind of albums they're more personal they're uh, you know outcast i was definitely trying to uh communicate to the kind of camel audience and uh and i think it was kind of successful in that way you know it's, it's people still tell me they love it you know yeah. and uh, my friend in poland the co-producer he uh he recently put it out on vinyl and uh so that's been selling okay yeah yeah I wanna all of which you can get through my Bandcamp page of course, yeah i will mention that in a couple of <laughs> and um and also re recently i did an album with and this was kind of it started before lockdown but it sort of continued through that uh an album with uh daniel daniel friend, with daniel biro biro yeah. friend of mine a keyboard player who i met in the 70s when i was working with ca the casual band yeah that's a, that's a very I, I listened to the stuff on this entirely last night it's a very good album actually very thank very you. well put together very good band. thank you i really enjoyed doing that i mean yeah. it's one of those typical especially in this day and age 
productions whereby Daniel's working on his songs at home. I'm working yeah. on my songs here. And then I'm sending him mine and he's sending to me his his stems. And then, you know, we're talking about what it needs and then I'll play and then I'll suggest something. And we build these things up just going to and fro. And but uh, we kind of knew what what sort of a feel overall feel we wanted for the album, you know, so uh, and that that was that that helped. And just because, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm quite pleased with a couple of the things I did on that, my, uh, my contributions. I really like Daniel's songs. And, yeah, so I get to play bass and sing and, uh, and write a few songs. That was, uh, that, that, that was good. Any, any possibility of doing the, a part working, of the album? Yeah, we're working on it now. I, in fact, yeah. I've got one up on my computer right now. Um, and basically this one is a little more, it's a little more open, a little brighter. And because it's more songs, it's some of Daniel's old songs that he never finished. And I picked up a few of mine that I didn't finish. And, uh, and we sort of like said, oh, well, there's some good stuff here. Well, let's rework them. And so that's what we've been doing. So it's it's kind of a little more AOR, yeah. you know, a little more pop influenced, but yeah. it's still got the same kind of instrumental feel. And uh, yeah, so, you know, bass and keyboards and voices. And the only drums on the record are played by me. Wow. Uh, I've got a little ad hoc drum kit here it's not a proper drum kit i just play bass drum yeah. uh, snare on a cohorn and i've got a tom tom and a, and a sim on various bits of metal that i can shake yeah. and uh basically we were trying to find a sound that could you know so so fed up with drum machines you know it's like ah. and but also you know how important is the pulse what is the pulse And um, could I do, uh, as my question, you know, could I do that? Could I provide that? So I just bought myself a cheap old bass drum and uh, then I started playing it with a beta and recording various pulses and lines and things like that. And uh, we've been sort of building things out of that so that it's, 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 it has more of a rhythmic undertone than the previous album. But it... Um, it's uh, it's it's you know the rhythm is being provided by a bass drum basically yeah made with by hand and um yeah i think it sound makes it sound different and makes it sound interesting you know yeah. what, what about <laughs> uh, good for you man what about i, I on the back cam I, i noticed also the uh, sketches of brain uh, the unfinished oh, yeah. song. why you end up It's very good, but why was the motivation of releasing them? At, what, was the the yeah. what was the point? What was the point of the releasing them to the public? If... Because I put them out there for free in case anybody was interested. It's very good you stuff. Know, yeah. You know, you well, thanks, but it's just it was never finished. And yeah, I suddenly yeah. found all these old tapes, and I was, you know, some of it was from cassettes. So I was sort of like investigating and digitizing them and thinking, oh, wow, I'd like to play around with trying to master these things just to yeah. learn about mastering and things like yeah. that. And I was enjoying doing it. So I thought, hey, I'm going to put these on Bandcamp and people can have it for nothing. But, you know, if anybody has heard my In the Meantime album and is interested into the state of my brain at the time, yeah. then maybe they'd be interested in this. But I'm not charging for it. You know, it's sort of, I'm, it's just, it's a curiosity. Yeah, it's very good, actually. Yeah, <laughs> I, I like your stuff, you know. The, uh, I want to bring your attention a couple a couple of gigs. Any any memories from the Night of the Prague Festival in Germany in, in 2018? There were a lot of great bands there as well. The the Sea Within, Riverside. And any you have any memories? So yeah, sure. I mean, you know, that was we played there twice. Yeah. And both times it was the weather was amazing. It was yeah. beautiful, sunny 
day and it's in a beautiful spot right by you know you just go down to the edge of where the, the, the fences are and then look down and you're looking down the Rhine beautiful you're quite high up and it's it's just a beautiful part of the the German countryside yeah. and um it was a great really relaxed very friendly audience and uh yeah. you know that was that was great we did that with Ton and Jason and then we did it with Pete, uh, Pete Jones. Yeah. I think, unless I imagined the whole thing, it's possible. I'm imagining lots of things these days. <laughs> I can't remember actually, now I come to think of it. But uh, yeah, I don't remember at all. But anyway, I don't remember. That's okay. Yeah, uh, but the, yeah, I remember that as being a very good gig. The one that I remember is. <laughs> was the one that very, you remember was it was very yeah. good indeed. The the other one that I saw last night was at the the one that you guys did at the um, the Royal Royal Albert Hall in September yeah. two eighteen. They sent you to. That yeah. it's a very good show, man. Very good show. Yeah, well, that was at the end of quite a lot of gigging that year. Yeah. I think that's the biggest tour we've ever done, really. You know, we did it in three bits. Yeah. We had the festival in the in the summer and yeah. uh, 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 the festival's sort of time, and then we had the the, the uh, in the spring. We were went to Japan, Turkey, Israel, and uh, and then around Holland and a few other places. Down to Spain, Portugal. Did we do Portugal? Can't remember. Anyway, we certainly did Spain. And uh, yeah, and then we did the UK. There were a few days off and then we did the UK part. And then the very last gig of the whole year's worth of gigging was the Albert Hall. So, you know, by that time we were, I think most of the time we were pretty good, actually. We were, it was a really good tour. I really, really remember that very very fondly because it was such a joy to play well you know pete jones is such a genius you know the keyboard player he's uh when he when we first found him discovered him in 2016 we did the the japanese you know one-off five-day japanese thing there was a festival and some other club gigs, which is on the Ichi uh, Ichigo uh, DVD. That was the first time we played with Pete, 2016. And so 2018 was the next time we had to get together. And, you know, Pete can play anything. He's just, uh, he's such a gifted musician and with an amazing voice. So it was such a joy to be back into a four piece lineup again which the four piece lineup for me is totally ideal because it's more organic everybody has their little space and you can you 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 trade off in in that within that space in the in the center of you all and uh it's, yeah so before we were rehearsing down at real world studios for about 3 weeks before going off to japan at the beginning of that tour and that was just so much fun that, you know, I think that came over in the, in the live shows because it was, it was perfect with Pete. You know, it just made the whole thing. We're all very different personalities, but it made the whole thing uh, gel together in its way. And uh, we would spend a lot of time sort of, we would rehearse all day at Real World and have some dinner. And then in the evening, we would just jam. We would just go and have fun. And that really brought us together, I think. You know, it developed a, a kind of a fluidity amongst us and a sense of fun in music, you know, that uh, amongst us. And that definitely, for me, that energy transferred into playing playing the numbers you know playing the songs as we rehearsed them because they're quite complex material so oh, we always play an arrangement we're not we're not really jamming when we playing the the set but you know it was just that energy that we had and the 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 the, the confidence in each other that 
transfer to the gig and so that for me was one of the, really the most enjoyable tour you know that was that year was 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 great musically uh very fun very satisfying yeah <laughs> uh, you, you you mentioned you mentioned spain again well your your next tour will start in in, in spain right you're playing uh In April, April 27th, you're playing Madrid. Then you go to Granada, Cadiz, Barcelona. Are we? Okay, I don't really know. I mean, I, I thought yeah. I heard that we were sort of starting in Japan, but... Well, the uh, website is... Uh, uh, maybe they will... Maybe, okay, so maybe they haven't released the, all the dates yeah. yet. There will be more dates added. Yeah, I think I, it's, it's a matter of confirming all this stuff. Yeah, you need to go for somebody to... Yeah, and... Uh, yeah. and uh, but there will be more. Yeah, and nothing this year, toward the end of the year. Oh, they'll. I think the end towards the end of the year. I've heard rumors of a rehearsal. <coughs> and usually they are. Going and to I the know year. that last time I got a message from Andy, it was uh, a couple of weeks ago, as I was on holiday, and uh, he just said, you know, I, I'm I'm writing a lot, doing yeah. a lot of writing. So, so who knows? I don't know. It's they no call you and they call you okay. It's you no good to ask me too much about you know what's happening with Camel in the future. I just don't know. You know, I mean, I if they call me up and I I know where I'm going, but you know, yeah. <laughs> until then I've got plenty of things to be getting on with. You know that, and that's the thing. So uh, I'm 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 happy. Uh, working away here and then I'll be happy to uh, get the call and say well this is where we're going because I've said okay I'm free you know and um, then it's up to them to sort it all out yeah. what does music mean to you uh, what does it mean to me yeah yeah I, that's a very good question <sighs> basically I think that and I, I, I've always been like this I realize now when I look back, um, I've always been translating, you know, hearing a soundtrack constantly in my head of one thing or another. I hear music, I hear music and there's no one there, you know. Um, so for me, that's a kind of a natural thing is that, you know, you just, you're hearing music. And I think that music is, well, as I've discovered by the people that I've met, that I've played with over the years, music is indeed that cliche, the universal language. Yeah. Uh, because I, I've played music with people whose language I don't speak very well. Yeah. And they don't speak mine very well. Uh, like I've worked a lot with Indonesian musicians, you know, yeah. and uh, in Indonesia. So I've been there working with those people and yeah. I'm a bit slow on languages. I've managed to learn a bit of it. But, um, uh, you know, so I've learned to be able to play and work on things with musicians with whom actually a lot of them I don't they don't speak. We don't speak the same language at all. So, uh, but it's, you know, it, it's, it's done through music yeah. and it's pretty clear when you speak in music, you know, is you uh, two people, you know, and he's playing this and you, you know, what you, you know, what you can hear. I can speak that language. Sure. You know? So, and that's how you, you, you communicate and with Absolutely. a smile yeah. and uh, you know, and sharing sharing something yeah I, i i asked the same question another musician last week and the person told me well music to me is the the soundtrack of my life yeah and i i keep on keep on thinking about that for for to me right i've been i told you Colin, i i've been listening to music 50 years four hours a day every day right yeah. you have a i don't know my music collection is about i don't know five thousand cd like three thousand vinyl a thousand blu-ray <laughs> have a lot right have a lot I buy more than I can listen to. Yeah. So why? What it means to me? I think uh, it, it's like magic. I don't know it. Yeah. 
It takes me places. Let me give yeah. it a Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would I, I, that. You know, on Friday, when I was beginning question, I was releasing to the album from Camel to give an idea about the question to ask you. Uh, you know, I have CDs. By now. So I put like a headphone, I drink a couple of beers, and it takes music takes me places. I don't yeah, know. Yeah, yeah, That's yeah. That's the yeah. best way I can describe it. It's, yeah. It's, it, it, the world is better with music, you know? Yeah. Uh, I don't know. I think if it were up to me, I would send, you know, Putin, I would send the guy music for him to forget about the war with Ukraine and let the other people alone. And, you know, it, it can be a beautiful thing, you know? It's, you know yeah. It's, if you if you are depressed or you lose your job or or a family member die, then music can oh, it's, totally. healing. it's a healing process or whatever that means yeah. to everybody, right? So it, but it's it's a it's a way of getting uh, it helps you to resonate with the parts of yourself, parts of your psyche, parts of your mind, yeah. parts of who you are. It 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 resonates with that, and, and it resonates on an emotional level, and therefore, it's a language that doesn't need to necessarily explain anything. It's a language that is there to invoke something, okay. to set something off in you, and to 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 to, to resonate with the, your emotional side. Whichever, whatever that might be, whether it's, you know, you're moshing in the pit with the, to, it's the same, it's the dopamine, it's the same process <laughs> that yeah. you're, you're being subsumed by the music. And yeah, uh, yeah whether you're at a classical concert, uh, you know, or whether you're, yeah, you're grunging down the front uh, in the, in the mosh pit, you know, yeah. or you're sort of like, celebrating at a at a, at a at a at a dance or you know and, I don't and, know. and, and, and the, what, what you, you dance, say what you say live being alive that's, that's what right what you what you say is very important you know you can be playing with a guy from indonesia a guy from japan a guy from china a guy from uh chile assuming that you don't speak those languages and you don't have to use the lemon human language to communicate you you use music to communicate you know, the drums start playing, and you start with the bass, and you know, the guitar goes, and that's communication right there. Precisely, yeah, huh? I agree with that. Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a beautiful thing, man. We need yeah. more, we need good music and, and more, you know, and, and make more peace in the world, man. We are, <laughs> we are killing the planet, and we are killing human beings, and nobody cares, and you know, nobody can stop Putin, whether you or this or that, whatever. We live in we live in crazy time. The COVID, how many billion live and die yeah. all over the world, and you know we need we need we need more peace. And uh, you know if we we destroy this planet, we will go to another planet, you know, and they will destroy that again, and then a hundred will destroy another. Planet. You know, we we I don't know. I, I'm not that I positive. Think, I think the the world is a challenging place. We we face very many dangers. And um, that I don't think we're all totally uh, aware of at the moment. Yeah. You know, I, I certainly not, but I'm trying to piece things together uh, because, you know, there's, you know, I don't know, talk about Putin, talk about, you know, but actually when you look around, there's no good guys in charge. Yeah. No, and, and, and also United States have got in trouble with other countries. So I'm not blaming, I'm, I'm using put it as an example, but yeah. as a war, as a society, a humanity. You know? Of course. You know, people, a good example, you know, come, people in the United States, they're always thinking about money and financial means and throwing away food. And, you know, yeah. you go to a garbage can or a rich family, half the food is, is thrown away. And people in Africa, they don't, countries in Africa and cities, they don't have public water, never mind a car. I'm talking yeah. about public water, food, basic food, you know, they, yeah. maybe it's too dry there. So you cannot, you know, the family cannot plant vegetables like you do with your wife. And it's, I, I'm, I'm sad about this stuff. I don't, I don't know who's, it's, you know, whose fault it is, you know, the people perhaps in Africa were, unfortunately were born in poor countries and they don't have the means like you and I, and the, the weather is crazy, so they cannot plan. 
you know, vegetable, fruit, or apple, apple tree, or whatever, and they, they are stuck. You know, you were born poor, and they end up dying poor, you know, and the country doesn't give a damn. You know, yeah, this is, you know, it's, it's a very, I, I totally agree with you. And I totally agree with your, your emotion. I, uh, you know, I, I, I try not to be sad. I try to, 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 to uh, I don't know, I try to be positive, you know, and just be local. Be, that's why I like being here in this little communal area here, is that I can have interactions with people who are totally different from me, but nonetheless, and they're, they're surface interactions, sure. but nonetheless, I have learned <laughs> that just on this local basic community level, where nobody knows who I am or if I am someone or whatever, I don't know, you know, some people have found out, but, uh, you know, I, well, anyway, I'm no, I'm just a normal, normal guy. <laughs> so, who happened to learn to play the bass. But, uh, you know, this kind of surface interactions that I have, but I'm totally aware that I can influence Absolutely. in a positive way Absolutely. just, you know, uh, the situation, the, the, the day-to-day situations that we find myself in with other people, you know, and just by a comment, just by a talk, just by being friendly, just by you know, to which most people are very, respond very positively, you know, then, uh, you know, without trying to get into the, the complexity of what's wrong in the world today, because it's very, very complex. And it does concern me that a lot of people see things in two simplistic ways, uh, you know, as if there was a good and a bad, and there was a, a right and a left. And these things are um, uh, sort of becoming meaningless and not not so much good and bad but we all have our ideas that you know one side is good and the other side is bad um whereas actually this is much more complex than that you know and yeah. uh, if any person thinks that they are so dogmatic in what they believe that they think that other people are inferior for believing the the, the opposite uh then you're not going to get anywhere that ends in war that ends in uh grief and misery what you what we have to try and do is that despite you know differences of opinion to be able to discuss these without killing each other absolutely man yeah and you know and, and from your business point of view right you are in a position to help a lot of people out right so of course, yeah. you need to make money. You're your wife, and, and keep the business running, and you know paying the bills. But yeah, yeah. you know all the leftover, the food that you you know, the vegetable you know that you will not be able to sell because they will stay there sitting on the shelf for a week. You know, give them away, help other people. You know, yeah, if everybody yeah. do I, like like you say, you know, help locally, right? I don't have to worry about the problem in Africa, right? I need to help my own neighborhood. You know, my yeah. own your area right if yeah. everybody's the same will be the world will be a a, a, a better place i suppose it's not a grow with making well I, I think i think that we 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 have to we whoever we are uh you know have to sort of entertain the idea of of doing this of like opening uh being a little bit more com communal in, in our ideas uh of, of pooling resources and things like that because you know things fall apart you know i mean uh it's, it's, it's you know with with uh with energy and you know big pressures to actually for you know to there's there's kind of pressures from all sorts of vested interests that are affecting uh these 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 changes in the world and and i think it's important to try and recognize where these vested interests lie and I, I believe, I don't know, but I think that it's, you know, there's a reason why things are getting more expensive and there's a, there's a, there's a reason why uh, the, the whole money system is changing. Mm. And we're, it's in a state of change at the moment. And so it's like this, the old model is winding down and there's got to be a new model brought in. And some people have vested interests in bringing 
this model in and uh you've got to be careful of all that i think you have to see try and see who's doing what difficult but yeah. you know uh, but in so in the end a positive thing to do is to yeah. act locally absolutely you know you know i and I, I, I i can think here in the united states you know there's united states you know, from the richest country in the world i think and uh and you go to california i was in los angeles recently and homeless people everywhere i mean yeah u.s citizen or or, or foreigners or whatever I've seen, seen things how, like in, that, yeah. how in the world how in the world people you know they they're they don't yeah. have a place to crash they look like food to eat if it's extraordinary millionaire billionaire yeah, yeah. and yeah. meanwhile especially during the pandemic you know there's a very small amount of people who really made a lot of money yeah and are even stratospherically richer than they yeah. were before and before, they were yeah. always, already rich so and yet meanwhile the trickle down effect is not working you know <laughs> yeah, you know, um, you know it, we live in, we live in we live in great yeah. but I'm, I'm happy that you know you're stop you're putting music like you mentioned in the background and playing good stuff that makes people happy man. I, i need to I need to visit your store one day, man. We need to. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like to, I would like to see your music collection too. We need to do like a, like you mentioned the the, the radio program, man. I have only a couple more questions uh, for, for to left that and uh, looking yeah, back, in, looking back at your musical career, what moment are special to you? Any any regret or thing you would have done differently? You know, it's very easy to look back and say, man, I should have done that or whatever, but. Any, yeah, different? of course. Of course. When you look back, you always sort of notice uh, that you missed a certain opportunity somewhere. Right. And uh, perhaps because you were being stupid doing something else. I I don't know. You know, yeah, sure. This, but, you know, what's the point? You know, I mean, I think to, of worrying about that, you know, uh, yeah. you yeah, you can learn from it. Of course, it's good to learn from realizing mistakes that you've made in the past uh, but there again now you're a different person so you know you've just got to say you have to go ahead with a kind of positive attitude that's a cliche but you know to to take joy out of what you're doing at this moment yeah you know and sometimes I can sit here and I'm trying to write something and I'm going uh, you know and that's yeah, you and your because you can't switch this stuff on you know you but you have to channel it you know yeah. and actually this is this is the one thing that I learned, and i've got to give a, a shout out to to this person but i had a sort of a like an epiphany moment that i couldn't really begin to act on until sort of now i realize that uh i've been able to appreciate that more in recent years but when I was with Steve Hillage Band and we played in Madison Square Gardens and I was backstage and there was you know like Atlantic Records were there Armit Ertegun Todd Rundgren was there and you know and I I'd sort of I felt like we did a gig and it's really rushed and actually now I hear it on the CD that, that's come out it's actually pretty good but we're really bursting through the numbers you know tempos are up Yeah. and um but i think it was just kind of like the the kind of the overwhelming of the thing and uh and i just feel i didn't quite connect with it but I, we went through the motions and i can hear now i was playing okay you know uh, i didn't miss anything but it, may, it was just a state of mind which is also interesting why do you get into these states of mind what is it you're unsatisfied with about yourself i don't know but i was sort of like i guess i was sitting there with a can of beer sort of or standing there sort of not talking to anybody you know and uh sort of like with my own demons and um this guy called michael narada warden who was a, a it's a producer a drummer very excellent drummer and uh, yeah he was friend of todd's i think and with atlantic records so he was producer at atlantic records and uh, he was sort of dressed very light colors and sort of gradiating good health and and calmness 
And, you know, he just came up and said, hi, man, how you doing? You know, did, did you enjoy the gig? I think he was just sort of saw I was standing on my own. So he, he was just a very nice guy who came over and started talking. And I said, oh, yeah, you know, oh, hi, you know. And um, I said, yeah, I saw well, it. Didn't, you know, somehow I didn't feel like I really connected with it. It was all uh, it all seemed to happen so quick. <laughs> and he said, he said, D don't worry. He said, don't worry. He says, don't forget, you know, you're just the vessel. The music comes from up there. Absolutely, yeah. You know, your music comes from up there and, you know, it just passes through you and you're the vessel and you serve it as best as you can. And uh, it's something like that. Uh, that's how I've always remembered it anyway. Exactly how he said it, I don't know. But it was the concept of that the music was coming from the universe it was coming from somewhere else and you're the vessel and you can choose if you like to by inference i sort of thought about this afterwards and, and thought you know well, yeah you can choose if you like to polish your vessel and make it look nice and be ready to receive and uh <laughs> and create the beautiful things that are are around us mm. you know but you've got to learn you're a transmitter like you with your radio show there you go yeah but, that, that, you know, that, that is you're channeling these beautiful things through to try to communicate with whoever is receiving it. And that's how I started to think. And that helped me sort of write some music over the years, kind of like just sort of uh, it's very tempting to sort of formulate things. And uh, but I found that it's always worked best when I've sort of just started and and going with an intuition going with a with a feeling and that i think with the intuition is sort of that's part of being intuitive about what's what's there to be received absolutely yeah 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 and also living in the present is, is important i yeah. um i i used to be the person that was you know, worry too much about what I'm going to do or looking back in the past, you know, why I did the decision or that decision or whatever. And uh, I'm trying now to enjoy my life by living in the moment, living in the present. I have no idea yeah. if I'm going to have a heart attack today or mm. yeah, I'm going yeah. to, or, or next week or, or 10 years from now. I don't know. I want to live my life and yeah, make I sure agree. that I'm I'm clear with my family, that I'm clear with God, that I, I have done something meaningful, right? I want to tell the truth. Yeah, I want you know you've got a, nothing wrong with making money, nothing mm -hmm. wrong with owning radios and this or that thing. I got you, but if that's the only thing you have done in the world, that's something to worry about. So mm -hmm. I, I do the right thing, help people out, and do this world a better place. Whether you write a book or you plant trees or whatever, do something good for humanity, help people out. I grew up in a Catholic family, right? So I I I, I know that you know some people have less than. You and I, and 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 try to do, uh, try to do, make this world a better place. If you want. So if 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 my time to go from this life to another life tomorrow, or if forty years from now, you know, do do the, do the best you can as a musician, as an engineer, as a doctor, you know, do the try to do the right thing in life. That's very important. And I listen to good music too, you know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And the, the, la the last question, Colin, uh, feel free to yeah. elaborate on your website, your podcast mentioned, so the listener can buy your music, you know. The, the, the list, of, sorry. Yeah, feel free to elaborate. You give, the, give the name of your the website where people can buy your music, your podcast. Uh, oh, yeah, okay. Well, well, so you know, if it, it's uh, colinbass.bandcamp.com. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, you can just go to Bandcamp and search for Colin Bass. Yeah, and you'll see some of the things I've been doing there. You can buy or just download, or you can just listen to it. You know, um, Bandcamp. You know, if you buy things through Bandcamp, they do. The, the, you know, they take their commission, but it's not a large one, and so you know that's the most agreeable deal for the musicians. Really, about I can I'm only I can only praise Bandcamp. You know, that's it's a really good marketplace, and. Um, yeah, so people, you know, it's like I put that little thing out for nothing, but some people gave me some money for it, you know, and some people were insisting on throwing money in the hat. 
so which is always lovely you know so uh always appreciate that but you know i wasn't going to charge for it because i didn't think it was really a finished album you know but yeah. <laughs> so but you know if people enjoyed it and uh, they want to you know what, what's, what's this thing that people do on social media you know buy me a coffee you know uh yeah. this kind of thing you know that's yeah. the so where a lot of people are sort of managing to sort of monetize their little part of the world you know so i'm all for that but uh, yeah bandcamp search for me colin bass on bandcamp i've got a website which i'm still working on you know it's got a few interesting bits in there i think but uh, i really you know i'm sort of writing my book so i'm sort of uh, i'll start serializing it there you know and uh, that's colinbass.com but you know, I'm so I'm I'm so busy with so many projects projects that the the, the book writing is a uh, still very, very slow process. You know? I don't know what you mean? Yeah, yeah. And anyway, oh. you know, you've got to think too much about talking about yourself, and I would rather talk to the universe through the music. You know? Absolutely, you know. <laughs> Even you though know. you know, there's there's a desire or a, to to sort of want to write some things down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Before you know, I'm not here anymore. But uh, Hey, you know, life is ephemeral and uh, who knows? Uh, it was you very know, nice talking to you. Is it also important? You know, huh? is, is, is it also important? You know, it's as important as you think it is. Yeah. Maybe it isn't, you know, I don't, I don't know who I am, but uh, make this world a better place and be happy, do the right thing in life, help people out. That's what life is about, according to me, but uh, my, yeah. my, my way of thinking. But it was very nice talking to you, Colin. So hopefully we'll. Meet up soon. We'll share a couple of beers. A pleasure, yeah. And, uh, and then we'll get together with Andres somewhere. Maybe we can get world. together with Andres. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know, and uh, and uh, and uh, you know, I wanna. I'm looking forward to seeing ba seeing Camel for the first time. I've never seen you guys play live, and uh, whether in Tokyo, whether in in Spain, in next April, we need to get together, go out to dinner, you know, after the gig or whatever. And uh, so. Yeah, I always like a good dinner. What do you prefer? You you are a beer type of guy or a wine type of guy? Okay, I guess I'm a well, wine kind of guy. I got you. Yeah. I like good wines, and I don't like I don't like drinking bad wine. Yeah, well, I will bring you. <laughs> I will bring you some Chilean wine. Though, yeah, you. yeah, I, I've wine. enjoyed some very good uh, Chilean wine recently. Yeah. yeah. Good for you. Well, say hello to your wife. Hopefully, good luck with the business, man, and and we'll then touch very very soon. It was very nice talking to you and. We'll get together with Andres very soon, man. Yeah, cool. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Thank Claudio. You. Appreciate it. Yeah. Appreciate it. Thank you very much, man. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.